Um, I'm going to try to present a slideshow as well as, as, well as giving you the, uh, the talk. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, unfamiliar with the technology, so this may be a bit uh, hiccupy, and you'll have to excuse me if I make mistakes with pressing the buttons in front of me. But let's try anyway. Um, obviously, I, I tried to write a book initially. I was trying to write a book uh, which would explain to the Americans why they should pay more attention to Norbert Elias. Very few American sociologists are familiar with any very much of his work at all. And um, one reason, of course, is that he writes about Europe. Uh, and he writes about things like courtiers and stuff like that that the Americans think that's nothing to do with them. Well, that was the original motivation. I have to admit that there has come to be a little bit more of a critical edge in some parts of the book, particularly in the conclusion um, brought on by, largely by George W. Bush and everything that he, he stands for. There's one chapter of the book called From Frontier to Empire. I was almost tempted to uh, call it From Frontier to Rogue State, uh, but uh, I didn't. Um, nevertheless, the book is partly a comparison between um, Europe and America, but I hope it won't be completely irrelevant to your concerns in Brazil and in Latin America generally. We might start, though, if we're thinking about uh, Europe and America, by uh, a famous remark by Robert Kagan in a, a little and very elegant book. He's rather a right-wing figure, but uh, a good writer. Uh, a little book he called Of Paradise and Power, in which he famously remarked, Americans are from Mars and Europeans are from Venus. And he went on to say, they agree on little and understand one another less and less. Well, I'm going to, devel I'm going to develop that uh, uh, theme a little bit today, but first let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the layout of my book. I'll just give you a list of the chapters. Uh, here comes a slide again, I hope. Um, the first half of the book, um, the first two chapters really, uh, um, correspond to that part of the American civil, uh, sorry, the, the civilizing process, Ubedein Protest de Civilization, where Norbert was writing about civilization in France and civilization and culture uh, in Germany. And then I go on to write uh, four chapters concerned with American manners, American elites, uh, the effect of living in a market society, and violence and aggressiveness, which roughly correspond to the rest of what was originally volume one of the civilizing process. And then the next few chapters, seven, eight, and nine, are concerned with uh, the processes of state formation and integration struggles, conflicts leading to further stages of integration. Um, chapter 10 is, I suppose, there's not exactly a counterpart to that, this in Norbert's original, uh, where it's called a concern with the growth of inequality, particularly in the last few decades. Uh, in America. And then 11, um, chapter 11, involvement, detachment, and American religiosity really has no counterpart in Elias's work, except I'm using his theory of involvement and detachment um, to tackle the peculiar question of why the Americans flaunt their religion uh, so much. I won't talk about that. What I'm really going to give you today is a summary of the final chapter in which I try to draw some of this together. And that's the chapter, of course, that corresponds to uh, Elias's um, uh, synopsis, right? El Elias's synopsis section or summary section at the end where he tries to draw together the whole of the two volumes of uh, the civilizing process. Um, I think my first theme for the day is drawn from a remark made by the historian, the American historian, 
David Potter. He died fairly young. I mean, he, he was very active in the 50s and 60s and died fairly young. And he made this marvellous remark. Um, he said it had been the curious fate of the United States to exert immense influence in the modern world without itself quite understanding the nature of this influence. And he said that in the 20th century, the United States developed, the, developed what was perhaps the first mass society, but the American cult of equality and individualism prevented Americans from analyzing their mass society in realistic terms. Often they treated it as if it were simply an infinite aggregation of main streets in Zenith, Ohio. In other words, I think it's true largely of, I think it's true largely of American sociology that, uh, that they have a very weak conceptualization of power um, of, uh, at large, and, and, and they're very squeamish about power in general. I'm generalizing, of course. But. Um, I think it's true of American sociology, certainly true, I think, of uh, Americans at large. In order to illustrate what I mean, uh, and because I think that Potter's remark about them not seeing each other very clearly, uh, seeing themselves very clearly, I want to develop some of the themes of my um, um, chapter. Let me summarize the first part of the book first, just some very brief ideas. First of all, the section that deals with the development of manners and habitus in, in, in America tends to show that the trends are not very different. Of course, when you're doing comparative studies, it's always a matter of whether you're looking at it from the point of view of half a whether the gla this glass is half full or half empty. There are differences, there are similarities. But I think you would have to say that the broad trend in the development of manners and, uh, and, and, and habitus was not very different uh, from Europe. Uh, there are some ways in which uh, America was ahead of Europe. For example, uh, in avoiding uh, in standard, social standards that led to the, the, the uh, the expression of overt deference, forelock tugging to your superiors, and also of what Casualtos calls superiorism, which are all forms of expression of social superiority. And there are particular reasons for that, which I think Cass will be able to um, uh, demonstrate for you, since I think he will be at the conference, unlike me. Um, But there's no single model setting class in, in America. I think one of the crucial uh, things about American history uh, is that there were various groups, a sort of old gentry class from the colonial era, which was transformed into various ways. There was a kind of New England Bildungsbürgertum, uh, educated middle class, professional middle class, which was not unlike that which Norbert Elias discussed in the Germans. And then there was the South and, the, and also the plut plutocracy. But the, uh, the old slave-owning elite in the South, I think, has left a very um, marked uh, effect on America. And in fact, it's become more prominent in recent decades because of internal political balances changing. And these different models, I think, conflict with each other inside America, and perhaps to some extent they conflict within, within individual, within individual Americans, that they, 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 there are conflicts between these different kinds of models which for many individuals are not fully resolved. So much for trends in, in manners. When it comes to violence, much the same is true, that the trends in violence are much the same. On the whole, the trends are down. And then most countries, including Western Europe and, North America and, 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 and the USA, have a, an upturn in the 60s, which then turns down again uh, in the 1990s. But the rates for some kinds of um, homicide, for example, um, are much higher in the states. Uh, 
it seems to be particularly cases of affective homicide, losing control, which of course is significant in the context of the theory of civilizing process. But moving on to the later chapters, again, state formation processes, they are a bit different in, in the USA, but there are also very great similarities. I, I would sum it up by saying, uh, contrary to the way Americans sometimes see, uh, see it, uh, that the state which we call the United States of America is not an emanation of the human spirit of American values and so forth. It's actually a product of wars and violence and genocide, very much like Europe uh, was. But yet, a lot of this is hidden behind the scenes of Americans' collective memory. Again, I'm generalizing. All sorts of qualifications need to be put in, but this is a brief lecture, and you'll excuse me if I seem to overgeneralize a bit. Why is so much hidden behind the scenes of Americans' collective memory? Well, I'd like to talk about three things. First, the uh, three or four things uh, taken from the conclusion. First of all, what I call the American um, homo clausus. Tocqueville said way back in the 1830s that America was the country where the precepts of Descartes were least studied and most followed. And by that, he meant that, um, in effect, what Elias would call I think we have to say that Tocqueville spotted something that Elias was to formulate in, with more precision later, namely that in American individualism, often the kernel of it is a kind of prevalent experience of homo clausus, the closed, isolated individual uh, mind that, that Elias discusses at such length. And the effect of this is that uh, as, as, as Tocqueville put it, Americans sought to avoid the bondage of system and habit of family maxims, class opinions, and in some degree of national prejudices to accept tradition only as a means of information and to seek the reason of things uh, for oneself and in oneself alone. Uh, each American, he said, appeals to the individual exercise of his own understanding alone. Well, I'm generalizing. I'm generalizing, but perhaps not as much as Tocqueville was. Um, at the same time, again, as um, Tocqueville emphasized, this individualism went along with, it was a form of social equality, it was related to the social equality that he discussed at such length. But it was also, he pointed out, something that was very conducive to conformity because um, equality places the stigma of arrogance. No, I'm sorry, this is Potter, not, uh, not Tocqueville. Potter says uh, equality, a spirit of equality, places the stigma of arrogance upon any man who ventures to set his personal judgment against the judgment of a majority of his equals. There's the, there's the quotation on, 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 the, on the screen for you now. Thus, the, le the main legacy of American individualism seems to me to be a kind of hodier centrism, uh, as uh, Joe Houtsblum called it, uh, a today-centeredness. And indeed, that is uh, not unlike, uh, well, two great thinkers. One was Henry Ford, who said history is bunk. Uh, and the other was David Reisman, who described in his famous book, The Lonely Crowd, uh, the in a, what he called the other direct personalities, uh, the modern American taking their bearings from other people. So there's a large literature on this. I don't want to develop that at great length because it's a complicated issue. And I, in the book, I make use of ideas like Elias's idea of the we-I balance from uh, the society of individuals. Let me go on to the second idea that I want to discuss from the conclusion of the book. Uh, that is uh, the idea of market fundamentalism and diminishing foresight. If you remember, Elias's prediction was that increasing social pressures would 
uh, lead to uh, would increase the pressure on people to exercise in greater foresight. Uh, and the implication uh, was that they they would look down longer chains of interdependence and would foresee what might otherwise be unintended consequences. Well, in my book, I make more use I make more use of the uh, the economist's idea of externalities. The reason it's, it's very closely related to the idea of um, uh, unintended consequences. But the point about externalities is it's the, the con consequences of people's actions, businesses or individuals or governments' actions, which may or may not be foreseen, may or not be intended, but which cause costs or suffering of some sort um, to other people, but which the person who gives rise to those doesn't need to pay for in any way. And the reason I think I prefer the idea of the economist's idea of externalities to this rather weaker idea of sociology of unintended consequences is that if you're thinking about the external costs, the externalities of particular courses of action that you don't need to take account of, that you don't need to pay for, um, it raises questions of power. People in weak positions of power usually have to clean up after themselves. People with great power, governments, businesses, or powerful individuals can get away with it. And the idea of externalities, I think, focuses on that very well. Um, as I said, Elias predicted that there will be increasing pressures towards foresight. Um, sorry, I just said that. Let me move on. Uh, but there is a problem today of what uh, the prize the Nobel Prize winning economist uh, Joseph Stiglitz calls market fundamentalism. And I think that we have seen in recent decades, not just in America, but particularly in America and Britain, the idea of um, as though markets were infallible, that you can't buck the market, that you don't need to do anything, uh, that the market will always guarantee the greatest happiness of the greatest, no uh, 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 greatest number so long as you interfere with it as little as possible. I happen to regard that as a load of bollocks myself, um, but then I was trained in Cambridge as an economist in the 1960s when such ideas were unfashionable and when the people who believed in them, like my Milton Friedman, were regarded as a lunatic fringe. Well, the lunatic fringe now, 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 now rules the world. Um, uh, but I think one of the things that worries me most uh, is that the hidden that that what they no doubt see as uh, Adam Smith's hidden hand of the market is in I think on the right wing of American politics linked to the idea of the hand of God. Uh, in other words, um, there's a kind of fatalism that we don't need to take responsibility for the consequences of our action between God on the one hand and Mar the market on the other, that everything will be all right in the end, no matter what we do. In other words, it's very much like the famous lines of Tom Lehrer. Do you remember his song about Werner von Braun, the rocket, the German rocket scientist? Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Um, and there are all sorts of concrete uh, illustrations of this. There's a famous book by Matthew Crenson in which he showed that in uh, Gary, Indiana, which was a United States steel uh, town, hugely polluted. The question of pollution never came up. It never came up because United States steel was the major employer and people didn't like to criticize. It perfectly illustrates this, this problem of if you've got the power, you don't need to worry about the fallout from your, your actions. And then you have to analyze the, the power ratios involved in each case. Um, 
I think that um, these ideas have been around for a long time. Uh, Karl Polanyi, in a famous book called The Great Transformation, stressed that uh, there is no hidden hand, that, the, uh, that all economies are embedded in societies. Uh, but one consequence of this outlook uh, on the part of the United States is that it's tended to promote kleptocracies. Uh, internationally, their, their influence through IMF policies has promoted a kleptocracy ruled by thieves uh, in, in places like Russia. Uh, but, um, but it's also happened uh, in uh, the... Um, sorry, I'm getting my slides out of order. Um, it's also happened internally in the United States with things like Enron, for example, where I think in many countries, but particularly in the States, we see huge salaries being ripped off. The average American chief executive officer is now paid over 400 times as much per annum as the average employee in his firm. It is quite astronomical. if I can work out how to work this thing. Well, that brings me on to the third topic, which I call functional de-democratisation. Um, Elias, if you remember, um, predicted that there was a, there was a, und there undoubtedly is a historic trend towards longer chains of interdependence. Um, today we see it particularly in, in globalization on a, a world scale, where chains of interdependence spread right across the world. But the point was that Elias argue, uh, seemed to assume or, or, and argue that, uh, that these longer chains of interdependence would more or less automatically be associated with the growth of what he called functional democratization, meaning that there would be more equal power, relatively more equal power ratios along the various uh, links in the chain of interdependence. And that in turn would be associated with a widening circle of mutual identification. Would that it were so. Uh, I think parts of that argument are true, that, and that some of the whole argument is true in certain circumstances. Um, but I think you have to question whether it's wholly uh, a valid uh, thesis. Nico Wilterdink and others have suggested that perhaps the trend towards functional democratization was more true in Europe because there was a large number of relatively small but effective states that were competing with each other. And uh, that there was a survival advantage of relatively more equal and socially more cohesive societies in international conflict. In other words, you've got to keep, uh, keep your people happy if they're likely to be involved in wars uh, with other people among relatively equal um, states. And that perhaps in that, perhaps in that, perhaps in that respect, Europe is a little unusual. Um, but the question is whether, in longer-term perspective, we've tried to take a more world historical view, uh, is it possible that increasing complexity and lengthening chains of interdependence have generally been associated with increasing inequality, more unbalanced ratio, uh, power ratios, in short, what I call functional de-democratization? I think you always have the feeling that with Norbert, he, he, Norbert Elias was thinking about horizontal chains of interdependence spreading out across the, uh, the world. If you think also of, of vertical um, uh, in, uh, chains of interdependence, you, 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 you also see, as indeed Norbert discussed, the, the concentration of, of power. But he thought that that would be reversed, I think. Now, he tends to assume that that will be reversed. The question is, will it? Um, I think a key point of my argument, uh, keep pressing wrong button, um, well, a key part of my argument is that the national experience of the United States of America 
over the very long term, in effect right from the beginning of European uh, settlement, has been of growing inequality. And in two, two respects. First, growing internal inequality, particularly in the, in the period from after the Civil War up to about 1920, and then it was reversed a bit under the New, uh, the new Deal, Roosevelt and so on. But then um, spectacular growth of inequality since the 1970s. But perhaps more important for today, um, <coughs> there's um, the fact that Americans' long-term national experiences of the power, the, the power ratios between them and their neighbours swinging steadily in their favour. And that means right from the beginning, at first they were at least they were probably, for, a, for maybe two years, the first settlers were more dependent on the Indians, uh, the, the Native Americans, uh, than uh, the other way around. But that soon changed. And then there's the whole history of uh, uh, the Mexican, uh, the, the, the wars of conquest, and uh, the use of American power to enlarge their, um, most obviously, the Mexican War, which, allowed, which resulted in America taking a vast amount of land from Mexico, and it led to that famous remark by Porfirio Diaz, poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States. And then it was, uh, there was the question of um, the Monroe Doctrine saying that the, uh, the United States had the right to, ident uh, to intervene in other people's countries in the Western Hemisphere. hemisphere. And then finally, what I call the W addendum. Um, if you look at the um, United States security policy document for the year 2002, immediately after 9-11, they come very close to extending the Monroe Doctrine to the entire world, saying that you know wherever anyone does anything that's not in America's interest, they have the right uh, to um, intervene uh, unilaterally. See where that got them in Iraq. But um, I think there is that. You cannot understand how they got to that position without looking at this national experience of just steadily becoming more powerful vis a vis um, their neighbours. What does that imply for mutual identification? Well, is it really true that? longer chains of interdependence will lead to a widening circle of mutual identification. I think it, it, it often is. In, I think we have to refine in what circumstances that happens and where it doesn't. But in the, um, in the case of the United States, I'm inclined to use what may seem at first an unlikely uh, and I, I use an, an analogy with Cass Walters and uh, Bram van Stolk's book, uh, uh, Frauen in Twestride, study of women in a, a battered wives in a in a refuge for battered women in 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 the 1980s, I think in 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 Holland. Uh, one of the most interesting things they found was that if you ask the women to describe the um, overbearing, powerful husband, these were on unequal power, unequal uh, partnerships. They could describe the men, uh, their, their individual husbands, in a lot of individual detail and their personal, uh, personal quirks and idiosyncrasies. If you ask the men to describe the women, it came out in terms of stereotypes, um, you know, the little woman, Tom. Uh, and it seems to me that this is probably true of all um, stereotypes, uh, uh, st all power on uh, unequal um, relationships. Um, for example, I live in Ireland, uh, as a, I'm British, per, British origin, but live in Ireland. The Irish know everything there is to know about their neighbour um, in Britain, minutiae of British politics and so on. Talk to the British about the Irish, and they talk in terms of 50, year old, 50 years out of date stereotypes. Irishmen riding around on donkeys and, and that sort of thing. Um, I may be slightly exaggerating, but I assure you, not very much. 
And you can see it in various other established outsiders' relationship. But it probably applies, in my view, to the biggest established outsider relationship at all, the, the established United States superpower and um, uh, the rest of the world. Um, Jo Houdsblom used the wonderful metaphor once of a one-way mirror. That is to say, we can see into the United States. We are like people sitting behind the mirror um, in, in, a, in a social psychological laboratory. Uh, and the brightly lit uh, subjects that we're observing are the Americans, and we can see them very clearly. But we are hidden behind the mirror, and it does seem to me that um, the, the, um, the Americans often cannot see out very clearly. I have a number of examples of that, but I'll cut them out for the moment. But it certainly seems to um, apply to the problem of mutual identification. I think that uh, there are a number of, I think there are a number of ways in which the power imbalance of the United States it, it's shown in all sorts of small things, like the very small proportion of Americans who ever travel abroad, for example, the tiny proportion of them who have passports, but the inward lookingness of the media and so forth. It's almost like, I think it's like a black hole. No, it's like a black hole in reverse. They can't see out. And I think we've all had experiences of that, where we know more about the Americans than they do of the, the outside world. Um, but it also this this problem I think also may apply within America. Uh, Joe Hounsbaum suggested to me a, a nice phrase: not mutual identification, but upwards identification, where more or less intentionally the power elite in America cultivate, if we may call it that, um, probably more or less consciously creates feelings of patriotism. Um, and that ordinary people believe in the American dream and everything is possible and uh, we can all become rich and so forth. But this strong development of we feelings towards the bottom of um, society uh, does not, uh, is not reciprocated and that in, in, in many ways I think that there is an increasingly insensitive uh, elite. Um, but that takes us into uh, political science, and people may disagree with me on that. Um, but what is, what is clear is that there is emerging within America, and of course also to a considerable extent in other countries, uh, a stratification between the, what you may call the protected strata and the unprotected strata. And again, uh, earlier in the book, I talk about things like health insurance, fairly short section, but um, there is, I think it's important, it's important to remember that for Norbert Elias, there was a very important connection between the level of danger, just everyday, the everyday hazards to life and limb of living in a society and the effect of living in an increasingly pacified state society and the sense of being protected. There are a number of ways in which in America, but also in other societies as well, there, there, there are, I mean, there are 40 million people without health insurance, for example, in America. There seems to be some sort of realignment of political loyalties as well going on that um, the concern with the 40 million who are not insured um, is not all that much taken. You know, it, it can't make itself felt any anyway, against the uh, strong vested interests of the medics and the health insurance companies and so forth. In fact, let's draw this discussion to a close by um, quoting um, what I think, I think Susan Sontag was making the same sort of point I've been making when she, in a famous article written just a few days after 9-11, she said, the disconnect between last Tuesday's monstrous dose of reality and the self-righteous drivel and outright deceptions being peddled by public figures and TV commentators is startling, depressing. Um, 
uh, and she goes on, where is the acknowledgement that this was not a cowardly attack on civilization or liberty or humanity or the free world, but an attack on, upon the world's self-proclaimed superpower undertaken as a consequence of specific American alliances and actions. So much for the uh, functional de-democratization. De I'm, I'm perhaps making this seem more political and more polemical than it is in the book, but I'm trying to summarize the, the general drift of my conclusion. Let me say a little bit about the American empire. Uh, a lot's been written about the American empire, uh, and this surely is of some concern to Brazil and Latin America. Um, I'm not going to say much, except to say that there is this idea among Americans that America has been anti-imperialist by tradition. Well, yes, it has, if you look at the historical re record, but on the whole it's been anti-imperialist, it's been anti-other people's imperialism, and it's been anti-imperialist when it's been in the American national interest to be so. I mean, again, this sounds like a crude summary, but it can be justified in detailed historical uh, ways. Um, but I think it's fair to say, as against those points, as against those points, it ought to be recognised that there were not just external external. I talked about externalities earlier, but there were also positive externalities. In other words, benefits, especially for Europe, in living under uh, Pax Americana in 19, the, period, the period of the Cold War from 1945 to 1990. And it ill behoves um, uh, Europeans to forget that they lived a very comfortable life, on the whole not paying, for example, anything like their fair share of, uh, of defence costs in, in, in that period. And that in that period, um, the, the, the strength of American armed forces balancing those of the Soviet Empire uh, actually created, as um, uh, Hopfrey van Bentham van den Berg argued, uh, a rather stable situation in which much of the world, was, not all of the world, don't say this in Vietnam, but much of the world was uh, able to live in rather st a stable and peaceful way. Um, and the reason why Kagan may have been right that uh, Europeans come from Venus and uh, uh, Americans from Mars uh, stems from Eliza's proposition that if people are forced to live in peace with each other, the moulding of the affect is gradually changed as well. Uh, or words to that effect, I've shortened it a little. Well, um, we have to recognise that Elias always viewed the steering of behaviour is not as being just by external forces, nor by internalised common values, our Parsons and so on, uh, the force of socialisation, but by a perpetual tension balance between the two. And it applies to large groups and entities as well as to individuals, that when external constraint disappears, or diminishes, then you try to get away. You find what you can get away with. And um, the diminution of the diminution of external constraints after 1990 um, uh, took a little time, it, it took a little time, particularly until after 9-11, to become perfectly evident. Uh, but um, it, it, it did become evident, and it's very clear in, for example, the American attitude to international law, uh, where the, the Americans do not, uh, the Americans do not recognise things like the International Criminal Court and uh, uh, various other instances where international law really doesn't apply. Whereas the, the Europeans tend to be very keen on international law because they can see more directly its benefits. But where you're very powerful and the external constraints on the exercise of that power uh, disappear, then you can expect, um, both in individuals and in nations, then some shift, not a, not a total shift from one to the other, but a shift towards seeing what you can get away with. And I think that's what's been going on these last few years with the Americans. Um, 
One thing that's relevant in these circumstances is Tom Sheff's theory, building on Elias, of shame, rage, spirals. Um, it seems to me that um, uh, the uh, let me let me explain. Uh, Tom Sheff says, well, first people feel um, they're humiliated and then they feel angry at being humiliated and then they become humiliated at feeling uh, angry and, and it can be, build up into, and he applies this to every level from divorcing couples to international relations. And it does seem to me that this theory applies to 9-11 and the behavior of America on the world stage since 9-11. Uh, and since the invasion of Iraq and so on looks likely to be counterproductive and seems to be exploring the limits of America or revealing the uh, limits of American power rather than the reverse. I think we can probably look forward over the next few years to further, in the next decades perhaps, further experiences of American humiliation. And I think uh, this can give rise, as Elias says, in the Germans to a very considerable collective emotional trauma. And we may be in for a rough ride, I think, for that, for that reason. Um, let me finish. I've, I've tried to work in the way in which the work of various other figurational sociologists uh, throws light on this conjuries of problems. Let me um, mention one other, and that is uh, Reinhard, uh, um, Reinhard Blomert's uh, argument that um, there is an analogy between the behavior of America on the world stage recently and the way in which Elias in the court society describes the binding of the king. In other words, the king was seemingly all-powerful in court society, but actually he was bound by his links with his nobles as well. And that one of the things that um, the, 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 the Ameri one of the things that the Americans have, George W. Bush and his circle have done, is to break those links. And the, the, um, there's very considerable uh, resentment, I think, on the part even of traditional allies of the United States. And the, the surveys tend to show that America, which was once one of the most admired countries in the world, is now uh, internationally the most hated, or along with Israel, the, the, the most hated uh, country in the world, which is a sad story. Let me conclude by a mischievous uh, point about the economist principle of path dependency. What the economists mean by path dependency uh, is uh, the idea that um, you don't have to be the, the most ideal, uh, perfect product uh, to set the standard. Um, examples. Um, why do, do most of the world's railways run on a five foot, eight and a half inches stand, standard railway gauge? Well, that's related to the width of the coal carts on the Durham coal fields in the north of England in the early 19th century. And the, the British built the first railways and then exported their standard, even though the rest of the world didn't even use feet and inches. Another example is in, in the English language, the QWERTY keyboard, the order of the, the keys at the top left-hand corner of a keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. Um, they were actually laid out in that way on the keyboard to slow down the keyboard originally on the first uh, keyboard so that people, people's keys, the, 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 the striking keys would not get entangled. Another example, of course, is the Windows operating system, which everyone knows is crap, but it's become the actual standard. So uh, there are enormous advantages in following it. It seems to me that the America, in many respects, has uh, got in such a position uh, today uh, that, uh, that there are many things about American society that are highly undesirable, that I personally, for example, would think that European social democratic models were a great deal superior to a red in tooth and claw, uh, unplanned, environmental thre environmentally threatening American 
uh, models, but the sheer power of America and the competition from the American model is, is tending to undermine uh, European uh, models too. Um, <clears throat> um, but I think that, um, uh, particularly when we think about problems of global warming, uh, it may well be that the, um, the United States, unless there is a, I can't see it, I know there's a bit of a change of mood now, uh, but the problems of um, free riders, uh, I think, are enormous. I don't altogether uh, see it as being possible that uh, in the world today uh, there will ever be a sufficiently binding framework for us to change carbon emissions sufficiently uh, to be able to uh, um, uh, avoid global warming. And I'm not blaming the Americans for that, but I think it's part of the American competitive model that there is, and that there is a rather widespread assumption uh, that um, uh, the pursuit of individual and national self-interest is, is, is something that uh, is not only unavoidable but desirable. Um, so I'm rather pessimistic about the future of the world. <laughs> Um, and on that note, which is perhaps should have been developed at greater length, I think this is the point at which to stop. And again, I really regret that I'm not with you. And this may have been a slightly rambling and technically not perfect um, presentation, but at least it's good to feel with you in spirit. And I hope maybe a year or two's time I'll be back in Brazil. Um, Probably Brazil may be the only place I can go on that side of the continent because the Americans will have put me on their banned list for writing this book. You never know. Anyhow, I hope you have a great conference and uh, look forward to seeing many of you in the future. Bye for now.